Hi, how are you today? Hi, hi, here's Jose. Um, <laughs> so, um, thanks so much for coming in and uh, have a look and hear uh, Gita, who is going to, to talk. It's the first webinar we are doing in, um, in this area. And um, um, so, thanks so much for coming in. Gita, my dear, thanks so much for uh, your time, for the preparation, uh, for being there. Also to my team for, for being there. And uh, yeah, please take care. We have a COC in place, even if um, we, you are in, in the chat. So take care of us. And um, yeah, get it, please, your time. Yes. Well, Thanks actually, I think it's, uh, well, I'm happy to see so many people. Uh, uh, this crowdcast is a new experience for a lot of us. And because of that, Ina will give you an introduction before I start my talk. I'm very excited. That's why I dressed up because it's the first webinar we're doing live. Um, I had too much coffee, but I hope um, you all can still understand me. <laughs> um, yeah. So hi, everyone. It's, uh, it's great that you're all here. And um, I know that most of you will probably know why are we doing this. Um, unfortunately, due to the whole pandemic um, stuff that's going on, um, most conferences have been canceled or postponed, um, like our Agile Testing Days USA, which was set for June this year. Um, Gitte was one of the many keynote speakers we had on stage uh, that we had planned. And so we thought that we definitely still want to keep this whole thing going to have something for the community to, to network, to share, and just to, you know, stay connected. And that's why we started the whole um, free webinar series. The next one will be in two weeks with Vernon Brown on how to achieve happiness. <laughs> um, this is also going to be a free one. And yeah, you can already sign up for that as well. It's going to be here on Crowdcast. And there's more in the pipeline, but you will get to know that hopefully next week. Okay, um, just a quick run through of Crowdcast. I think maybe some of you know this already um, on the right hand side of course you see the chat um, which is just nice to um, yeah to chat of course with people and maybe to say hi where you're from it would be great to see you know from where you're tuning in a uh, town city country forest bathtub whatever just tell us where you're at um, so that's like the main communication tool you can share things in there or put in some links if you want um, if you have any questions, though, then we would ask you to please um, put that in the ask a question box, which is kind of in the middle of the whole screen and the black uh, surrounding ask a question is the name. And you can either vote on the questions that have already been posted, um, you know, to give some kind of feeling for us, which one is most valued, or you can just post your own question. That's pretty much it. Um, after the session, the whole session will be um, available for replay already in this Crowdcast. But we will also have a um, YouTube um, video uploaded in a few days. So you can have a look at that too. And I'm pretty sure that if we are not able to answer all questions, um, that Git is happy to answer those um, after the whole session in the next couple of days. Um, then there will be a blog post about this. So, um, yeah, you should check out what we make out of the whole content. We will get you here today. So that's that. Uh, another important thing is um, to say thank you to Inflectra, which is one of our sponsors for Agile Testing Days 2020. And they actually, um, you know, kept, kept uh, being there for us until next year, uh, which is pretty nice. So um, thank you so much um, to them. And now to Gitta. Well, um, for those who don't know Gitta, <laughs> I don't know who doesn't. Um, she's a very dedicated Agile coach. Um, she's an absolutely amazing hugger. If you haven't had the chance, now it's pretty difficult, but I'm sure we, you know, have some kind of uh, chance to hug. Um, and she is just loving and living Agile. And also for us, she's um, like an Agile testing day veteran. Uh, she's been on so many conferences and... Um, she has ever since become globally renowned for being a great speaker. So um, we are happy to have her here. She says of herself that she's some kind of a geek. I think she is the most human human I have met so far. And I really adore her capability to give people courage to just embrace 
um, themselves and to be um, good with all their imperfections. So um, thanks so much, Gitta. And um, people, hope you enjoy the And now I'm just going to pass it over to Gitta. <laughs> Yeah, our, we will do the, see if we can share screen, which worked before. <laughs> uh, uh, I Apparently, when you have full screen, you cannot share screen. One moment. Yep. I learned something new about this program. Uh, always good to learn. Um, Here we go, hopefully. Uh, and now I have to do the thing that you always do when you have your uh, online bingo is, can you see my screen? Uh, <laughs> so uh, hopefully you should also be able to see my video. Uh, yes, I do that. I think okay, you, oh, you do that. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so you see my screen now. Does anyone see my video? Yes. Okay, I don't see my video. That's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about psychological safety and mental health in times of crisis. I decided to uh, talk about this because it's very important to me. Um, when I look at who I am, um, very much of what I do is about some kind of safety. Uh, like... Um, like Ina said, I'm a big hugger, and part of what I do is I hug people. But I also, ever since I've been a little girl, I've been trying to create safe environments for the people around me. And it wasn't until 2017 that I realized that this is something that is called psychological safety, about creating safe environments for people. Uh, I put up the picture of me and Morgan at one of the Agile Testing Days uh, parties, because Morgan and I have kind of been on this journey together for three years, and we have been developing training materials on psychological safety. Um, so we have a, a one day training and a short training, um, but mostly we have been working with it together for more than a year inside a company. Uh, so my interest in this kind of goes from, from um, working with it and doing it. Uh, one of my friends once said to me, you are kind of, when I think of safety, I think of you. So a lot of what I do in workplaces and uh, when I'm part of organizing something is I try to create a space where we can all be safe, where there's room for all of us. Um, and yes, I work with courage as well. And for me, courage is very much about having the courage to be who you are and speaking up about what is important. Uh, I've always, I've also been interested in mental health for a very long time. So I put up these orange socks, which are depression socks. Uh, which are from the Danish Association of Depression uh, and on national, international, I actually think it is uh, Depression Day, Depression Awareness Day, you can wear these depression socks, socks um, to kind of, of show people that this is something we need to talk about. Uh, I've been talking about it at conferences since 2014, uh, where I talked about my own stress and depression, but also realizing that mental health is not just something that is important for people who have some kind of mental illness. It is also important for people who don't, because we need that mental health to be able to work in our physical world. I'm very much on Twitter, which is why uh, I put that in big letters. So if you follow me, you will know that I tweet a lot. Um, and my pronouns is she and her. So the first thing I will do today is I will talk uh, very shortly about what psychological safety is. And then I will talk about what happens to us in this situation that we are in right now. Um, because it has a lot of effect on psychological safety, but it also has a lot of effect on our mental health. So that's what I'm going to do. And the idea is for me to not speak too long uh, with predefined slides, but actually leave a lot of time for questioning. You will also get access to my slides. I don't know how, because I haven't actually looked into that. And there will be links to uh, all the material that I refer to, to some of the pictures. And um, and there will also be my contact information if you want to contact me and talk about this later. So I will start out with psychological safety and why it's important. 
And this is kind of like the very short introduction to it. Psychological safety. The one that I use the most, the definition that I use the most is that psychological safety is being able to show and employ oneself without fear of negative consequence of self-image status or career. Whereas Edmund, and this is from Khan, whereas Edmonton talks about, it's also about speaking up, questioning things, concerns and mistakes. The thing about psychological safety is that it's very much based on our beliefs and our fears. How do we feel in this situation? Which also means that it is quite individual and it can actually be context dependent. It can even be depending on what day you are in, which of course is also a context. Um, so when you can come to work one day and just feel like you don't want to speak up about anything because you're afraid people will make fun of you. And even though that might seem like a small thing, part of what we do at work is we are often experts at what we do. And when we're experts at what we do, we have this self-image that we need to prevail. And we also have the thing about we have a certain status uh, in our group. We have the career. But it also, psychological safety is not just relevant at work. It's also relevant in our daily lives. Do we actually speak up? Do we question things? It can be in our families or uh, it can be in all kinds of areas. And psychological safety is important both for individuals and teams, but also from the company side. If we look about it from our individual side, it's very much about having the space to be who we are and not be afraid to speak up about things. Whether that is new ideas or questions or whatever it is, and about not being afraid to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. We have backspace on our computer. Uh, we all make mistakes all the time. And um, we need to create environments where this is okay, where we can feel safe enough to do this. Seen from the company's perspective, it is very important because if we don't have people who feel safe enough to ask questions, to rise, raise those concerns, we might end up in situations where people get damaged. So uh, if you look at Boeing, for instance, they had some planes that fell down and people had been trying to raise these problems inside Boeing for a long time before anyone um, and but um, I'll just back up. <clears throat> Boeing people inside Boeing have been trying to raise these problems for a very long time, but the problem was they were either bullied or fired, so they stopped speaking up. And Boeing didn't do anything about it until the second plate failed down. So in this case, it cost human lives. And if you look at it in smaller scale, what happens when people are afraid to speak up or make mistakes is that we don't get the really good products, the learning products, the innovative products, which is part of what we need today. A lot of people um, confuse psychological safety with being comfortable because it sounds like that, that you feel safe when you feel comfortable. And yes, if you feel comfortable, you usually also feel safe. But safety is also about creating an environment where it's okay to feel uncomfortable. So if you make a big mistake, let's say you take down the whole system of your company, that is probably not going to be comfortable. Or if you feel really bad a day and you want to tell your team, that's not going to be comfortable, but we need it to be safe. So that is what psychological safety is about and why it's so important for individuals and for companies. The thing is, psychological safety is important in a normal world. Mental health is important in a normal world. But something happened and right now we don't live in a normal world. We live in like this strange sci-fi apocalypse uh, world. It almost seems like, like somebody wrote a really bad movie and now we just happen to be in it. Um, a lot of people talk about, oh, you should be doing all these things now that we are working from home. And I totally admire the people who can make all the amazing videos that help us uh, make us laugh, the people who get their books written and stuff like that. But that is just not all people because we are now in a pandemic. We don't know what the future holds. We, most of us don't know how long we need to stay at home. We get these graphs all the time that my, may or may not make sense. I consider if I should put anything on it, but kind of like, it seems like we, we are looking at graph all the time, kind of like, is it going up? Is it going down? Does it have the right uh, slope on it? And 
somehow it seems like everything that kind of comes out is in our heads. It just gets so full with all these things, with numbers, with what do we have to do? What don't we have to do? And we have scientists working all over the world trying to figure out what do we need to do? Uh, what is the right distance to keep to people? Is it one meter? Is it two meters? Nobody really knows. A lot of it is guesswork and we are learning about this disease all the time. In the beginning, people thought it was just about lungs. Now they know that it, for instance, um, is a lot about the cardiovascular system. So there's so much going on and it's just taking up so much of our brain power. A lot of us, or probably most of us who can work from home are working from home, which means that first of all, all of our work interactions are on the screen. All of a sudden, no matter what we do, if we are coding or if we are talking to someone, if we're trying to work to as a, together as a team, we only have the screen to do this through, which means that we need to pay more attention. For instance, um, when we are in a meeting, the bandwidth of what we see, no matter if there's video or not, is smaller. Not necessarily the technical bandwidth, but the emotional bandwidth. We cannot read people's faces as well. We cannot um, see their movements. We cannot. We can usually only see part of their body. So what happens is we have to really concentrate to try and get all this information that we normally get to evaluate a situation. And a lot of the things that in a normal conversation, for instance, would make sense, like silence, is interpreted differently. Um, I just read some German research that said if there's even 1.2 seconds between someone being asked and uh, answering, people interpret that as either not wanting to answer it or not paying attention. And even worse, when there is not a sync between the video and uh, and what you're hearing. One of uh, my my uh, one of well, one of my friends was doing a talk recently where there was 30 seconds in between what people saw and what they heard. Um, and our brain can't cope with that. Our brain can't figure out what's going on. Plus, we have to focus a lot more. And when we're working in teams, we still need to figure out how does a team work together. Some are alone. Some um, are like, for instance, I am single and I can work from home, which means that I don't see anyone. I had coffee with a friend on two days ago, and that was 20 days since the last time I had an interaction with a real person. And so some people are sitting all alone home, and that can be really bad for our mental health. But it can also be really bad physically for, you know, we're not move, might not be moving enough. We might not, uh, we don't get all our needs satisfied. Even the fact of just getting a hug from someone um, like Ina was talking about. And some are not ever. <laughs> um, some people are locked in with their families. And uh, in some countries, you are not even allowed to go out. Uh, except if you go shopping. Um, and even, so I'm in Sweden right now and we have it fairly, um, most of it is based on recommendations, which means that we can actually go out. We can actually go to the supermarket. People, uh, kids go to school, stuff like that. But even with that, as long as someone is a tiny bit sick, um, they are sent home like the kids, which means that people have to do their work with a kid in the house. Or in some countries, you have to homeschool. And at the same time, you are kind of expected to do your normal work. Plus, you are together with the same people all the time. And even though uh, we hopefully love the people we are with, that is still a strain to be together with the same people all the time. And another thing that happens um, that is sadly seen now is that the amount of domestic abuse is rising because if you live with an abuser right now, you cannot leave the house. You cannot go to safety. You might not even be able to call a hotline. Uh, the dark net of, for instance, child point is growing at the moment. Uh, so there's a lot of this kind of going on. If we look at the other side of it is, for instance, for people living alone, stuff like eating disorder are also on the rise because people, nobody can see you. 
nobody can react to you getting thinner and thinner if they only see your face. Um, and maybe you can, maybe you want to block the camera. So there's all these things. And uh, oh, something I forgot to mention with the whole thing about working from home is that some people don't like videos because they don't want to show other people their home. For some people, it's very uncomfortable to all of a sudden have this of having home and work being in the same place. They don't want to share their work life with their private life. So they don't want to have their videos on. Some people are embarrassed about their homes. Um, I've been reading something from the US, for instance, where people are embarrassed because they live in a poor home uh, because they might not have a workplace. They might need to walk from a bedroom um, uh, or from their children's bedroom. I mean, I've had a lot of conversations with people who uh, live in a Barbie world, apparently, uh, where it turns out they're just working from their daughter's bedroom. So the safety of that, for instance, do you feel safe enough to show you home? Do you feel safe enough to show your face on screen every single day? And our days very much turn into the same. You eat, you work, you have lunch, you work, you have dinner, you watch Netflix, you sleep, you repeat. Um, especially if you are not allowed to go out. Maybe you have some extra ones. Uh, like in the UK, you can go out once a day. So you have, a, okay, I'm going to go out once a day. But the days become the same because we don't do the things that we normally do. A lot of our recreational activities are gone. We don't go out to restaurants. We don't go uh, to visit each other. Um, people are becoming a lot more careful. And a lot of this just becomes the same and the same and the same. And you will be like, what day is it today? Uh, even the weather is confused. I mean, here in Sweden, we have snow right now. So the weather thinks it's April or something. We had 18 degrees the other day. But things just come into this where it's always the same. And everything is online right now. If you are relaxing, if you have a party, if you attend a training, uh, whatever you do with anyone who's not in your house, it's online. You have to sit and you have to watch the screen. There's not the boundaries that we used to have. For a lot of us, the computer um, is the place where we have contact with people who are not in our area. For some people, that is the place they work. Some people like gaming. Um, some people, uh, you know, like to go out to trainings where there's actually people. But all of a sudden, all of this is in the same one. I know a lot of people who really struggle with this about being home and about working too much. Or I don't enjoy playing my games because all of a sudden my gaming place, my office is my office place right now. I don't have a private place where I can play computer at home because it has become my office. So all of these boundaries kind of flow and it can be really hard to figure out where we are right now. And for a lot of people, this also means that they start working more. And it can become really, really hard to focus. We can have, um, we have to pay attention to a lot of things. We need to listen more carefully. And we might try to actually uh, force ourselves to do things and come up with the new ideas that we need to do. And But the problem is all these things might not happen. And sometimes it just feels like our brain is just going in all directions and it's empty. Another problem with this focus is that there are endless possibilities. Like right now, I was just looking in the chat before I started talking. We have people from all over the world. All of a sudden, you can attend things from all over the world. One of the things I'm attending at the moment is uh, Lean Coffee in South Africa, which I would normally never go to because it's far to travel. But right now, since it's online, I can do that. But that also means that there's all these opportunities. How do we focus on the right things? And all of this puts a lot of strain on our safety. Are we doing well enough? Are we performing enough. And a lot of people actually work too much. So I was having that discussion online the other day um, and Matt was saying, there's like two things about this working too much. There's the fear of being fired because there are a lot of companies firing people right now. Am I doing well enough so that I won't be the one getting fired? But there's the other part of it is, here is something I can control. 
I cannot control when I can go out again. I cannot control what the rules are here. Uh, I cannot control the virus, but what I can control is my work. So at least that's one thing I can control. And that's also something we see, for instance, with people who have the imposter syndrome is that they tend to work way, way, way too much because they are afraid that somebody will find out they're not good enough and then they'll get fired or whatever. So that fear that we normally have about, you know, how are things at work? Will we get fired? Will I be made fun of? This is kind of even more now that we are working from home. So I brought in Maslow's uh, pyramid of needs, um, even though um, this has been questioned a lot, I think it still makes sense to talk about. Uh, Maslow made a lot of mistakes with this. For instance, he only looked into healthy people because he didn't think it would make sense, for instance, to look into anyone who had uh, any kind of mental problems. Um, plus, uh, he never really, um, at the end, he didn't know if the top was actually the right one. But the thing that's happening right now I think is actually bringing us down to the bottom. A lot of us find it hard to sleep. The bottom part of this is eating and sleeping. Some people are afraid to not have enough food. If you look, uh, for instance, at some of the pictures from the US, um, you will see lines of lines of lines of people standing in line to get food because they cannot pay for it now that they got fired. There is the safety part about we are afraid to lose our jobs, we are afraid to lose our house, we are afraid to lose our dear ones. And um, we even go up to part of the belonging part because we are not seeing our friends, we are not seeing our family. Um, some are, of course, but I know a lot of people who haven't seen their family for a long time. Um, and sometimes um, that also matters a lot. But really we are going down to a lot of the basics and that creates a lot of fear in us. So this means that um, a lot of our mental health is being challenged by this. A lot of people have more anxiety right now. A lot of people find it hard to focus. But also the whole thing about, are you safe at work? Because it's about our impression. It's not about, are you actually safe at work? Will you be fired or not? It is about what is my fear of being fired? What is my fear of not being good enough? What is my fear of not providing enough to my team? Some people can't work full time from home because they have kids. What happens to that? You know, am I an okay worker, for instance? So there's a lot of this going on. There's, of course, also good stuff. We can actually work from home, most of us. Uh, my guess is that everyone who is on this probably is probably able to work from home. And I am hoping that once we get out of this, there will be more for people to actually be able to work at home. We have more family time, which in most cases is good. And we have the whole world in our hand. We can just go out and we can pick events. And one of my favorite is SGN, which is Some Good News, uh, which is a show on YouTube where John Kaczynski uh, once a week makes a show about some of the good stuff happening in the world. So not all is bad, but a lot of it is really, really stressful for us. So now you kind of want to know what do we actually do about this? The first thing that you need to do with all this is to be kind also to yourself. Because most of us are in a strange situation. I don't think I know a lot of people who actually feel like, yeah, this is just fine, even though they might not talk about it. So the first thing that you need to do is to take care of yourself. Uh, if you are able to, not everyone is able to. So try to eat healthy. It is so easy for us to get caught in eating snacks. I can join that one. Um, one of the hotlines that is actually more busy is the anonymous alcoholics, for instance, in Denmark, because a lot of people are drinking a lot more because we are home all the time and, you know, I'm not going to drive anywhere. Uh, but eating healthy is good both for your physical health, but also for your mental health. Uh, take enough breaks. We tend to not take enough breaks. And one of the things, for instance, is if you're in a workplace, 
even if you have back-to-back -back meetings, you usually go from one meeting room to another meeting room. Here we don't. We just close down one call and continue the next. Uh, we just sit and work very focused because we're all staring at this computer. So taking those breaks and also taking breaks away from the screen and not just have entertainment on screens. Um, moving, whether that means you're going to go taking a walk or you're going to walk around in your apartment or even so someone doing marathons in their backyard. Um, I'm totally not going to do that ever. But um, if you can move, that is really good for your body. Of course, if you are really stressed and you kind of push yourself that you have to move and start blaming yourself, it's not good for you. But that's the same with all these things. If you start blaming yourself, then you won't get the benefit of it. Watch your sleep habit. Try to go to bed at a regular time. Try to get enough sleep. Um, but also, if you sleep too much, make sure you set the alarm clock. Get up. Watch these sleep habits and make sure that they are healthy. And maybe uh, something like limiting intake of news. Because the news can be really overwhelming. And if you look at news sites, most of it is about people getting sick or dying. Or, you know, people saying stupid stuff about people getting sick or dying. So most of these news can be really overwhelming. And please be kind. You deserve this. You are good enough. And you are dealing with this the best you can. So be kind to yourself. So what can we actually do for us? Well, it's a little bit about the same things. But for instance, at work, a, new, a good idea might be to create new working agreements. like. Do we need the video on or not? For some people, it's very uncomfortable to have the video on. And for other people, they don't care. Uh, my recommendation is that if you don't feel uncomfortable with it or unsafe with it, have your video on at least a little bit. But maybe also turning them off so that you only work with sound because then your brain only needs to relate to one thing. And especially around communication, you, need, you might need new agreements because what you can do when you're sitting in an office is you can look over and go, oh, yeah, looks like Peter's available. I'll talk to him now. But you can't do that when you're sitting um, online, everyone. So do you actually contact Peter on Slack or do you wait until you have a meeting? Do you book a meeting? Uh, because all of these things that come really natural to us are not happening the same way. Uh, it can be... Um, if you're working on your own, but still in a team, like writing in the Slack channel, okay, I'm going to lunch or stuff like that. So make sure you talk about what actually works for us now that we are online and talk about it. The team that I'm working most with right now has actually put in an extra element called how are you so that every morning people talk about how they are. And most of the time they are not talking about deep stuff. They are talking about, you know, did I sleep well? But sometimes people actually start opening up and sharing about how do I feel about how things are at home, being stuck with three kids and they're making noise and I'm trying to do my work. And be empathic. Um, listen to other people and try to understand their situation the best you can. And be kind to people. And make it okay to be in a bad place. Make it okay to say, you know what, today I am just in a terrible place. I'm probably not going to get enough done. Make that okay. But also, remember, you are still responsible for your actions. So even if you feel terrible, if you, let's say you feel terrible and you yell at a person, go apologize the next day. Uh, I put in this, I don't know if you can see it, but this is uh, a guy from the who works for the Canadian government who actually sent out this, uh, this is going to look really strange because I need to go closer to read it who send out this email to people that says, you are not working from home. You are at your work during a crisis trying to work. Your personal, physical, mental, and emotional health is more important. Your success will not be measured the same way. So there are a lot of workplaces who are actually good, but there's also a lot of workplaces that expect you to do exactly the same thing, even if you're working from home in this situation. Um, I even had a friend where someone told her, just tell your kid that mama is now at work. That is not how it works. If you have a three-year-old kid, that's not how it works. So we need to actually take that into account. 
So this is all that I had, except that there will be also my information and there will be links to some of the stuff I talked about. Uh, so now I will stop sharing this and go over to questions. Maybe if Ina is uh, going to ask me questions, or do I view them myself? Okay, since uh, I cannot hear Ina, I'm assuming you also can't. So uh, the top voted question that I can see is, What's what's a small daily thing? What are small daily things I can do to enhance my own and other psychological safety and or mental health? Um, so I think that some of the daily things you can do uh, is actually talk to each other, like actually ask people how are you, and you can choose to do it different ways. Some people don't like to talk a lot about emotions, uh, and then you need to find a way to go like, uh, am I okay today? Yes, no. Uh, other people are more comfortable with going into talking about their emotions, but actually making this something that you can do. I think talking to a person who is not work related is also very important. So if you live alone, for instance, call someone, uh, call your grandmother because she's probably missing you if, if she's still alive. Um, so talk to a real person. I think that is really important uh, for the mental health. And also this about sharing. And I think if you start sharing this way and start learning a bit more about each other, that also creates a more psychologically safe environment. Because as soon as we can start sharing these things and building that, um, it creates even more safety for us to go in and do some of the other things, to go in and make the mistakes. So talking about these things, um, talking to real people, and then I think the taking break is really, really essential. Whether that is that you just walk into another room and go get your coffee. Um, but having those breaks, I think, is really essential. Um, also, when you have the teams. Another thing that I found uh, is important with teams is to actually have something social together. Because even though we feel like sometimes we just go to work and we do work, what we also do is we talk at the coffee machine or... When something is compiling, if it takes a little bit longer, we do some, we talk a little bit about this and that. So a lot of the teams that I've been working with have actually started having uh, coffee. So just half an hour a week where they have coffee. Um, we also have that on a, on a department level. So having these small social things and not underestimating that that is also a part of work to have these social things. Um, feel free to ask more questions in there and vote for the questions who are there. It's very interesting having... To, um, I am just going to switch to my reading glasses. My team wants some way to measure how psychological safe people feel, how the morale is for each team. I'm thinking a survey, survey like um, Amy Edmondson's, do you have other suggestions? How can they see what level they're at and where they should try to go next? So uh, I have good experience with the survey from, from Amy Edmondson, uh, where there are some different questions you can ask about how do you feel in your teams. But that can also be a big thing to, to set up for some people. Uh, there are some apps out there that you can use to go in and figure out how the team feels. You can make it more simple. Um, you can have a, um, uh, like a mood barometer, I cannot even say that, like a mood scheme where you kind of have, uh, I feel perfectly fine, I don't feel fine. Like one of the things that I do when I go into, um, when I go into retrospective sometimes is I use the safety questions uh, that Norm Curve provided in his book about retrospectives, where uh, number one is, I feel I don't feel safe at all, and I'm just gonna smile and nod. Uh, and number five is I feel safe enough to speak about anything in this room, even if it makes me uncomfortable. 
so having those five uh, questions somehow, um, I also know some people use, for instance, Mentimeter or something to measure these things. Um, so it depends on how deep you want to go into it. If it's just like, okay, uh, let's do a temperature reading, see how people are doing, then use some of the simple tools. If it's something you want to work more actively with, I think uh, doing Amy Edmondson's uh, survey at least once in a while uh, is something that is very valuable. Also because what happens sometimes when you do these things is you get a uh, surprise about uh, what people actually, uh, how people actually feel. The first time I did it, uh, one of the things we found out, for instance, is that 7% of people in that area um, felt that there was someone in their team that would deliberately undermine them. And this was in an area where we felt everyone must be feeling safe. So having these surveys anonymously in some way, I think is, is very helpful. Um, and preferably if you can go in and make these um, as simple as possible in the beginning, I think that's very helpful, especially if you do it on a daily basis. Uh, one of the teams that I'm working with uh, have like every day when they check out, they write, how, did you, how do you feel about today from one to five? And then they kind of look at the trends when they go into the retrospectives, for instance. Uh, uh, let me see. This is very interesting. Now I need to kind of figure out which one I asked. Um, hi, are there any red flags apart from not daring to talk or say anything to identify a not psychologically safe company or community? I think that is the interesting part. Um, the company that I'm working in right now actually asked me to come in and work with psychological safety. And their leader of this department said to me, we think we have psychological safety, but we also know that if we don't, we probably don't know it. So from the outside, it can often be really, really hard to see if psychological safety is present. So some of the things you can be aware of is like, do people speak up? Um, does everyone speak up, for instance, in a team? Um, maybe not everyone wants to speak up, but, but if there's some people who never say anything, maybe have a discussion with them. Um, figuring out if, um, you know, if, if things are too perfect, then it might also be a sign. So one of the things that uh, Amy Edmondson talks about in her TED talk about psychological safety is how she went into a hospital, for instance, and she looked into how many medical errors there were in the different departments. And what she found was it looked like the departments that functioned the best had the most medical errors. So what turned out was that the department that um, actually had the least medical errors and were wor working the worst, they didn't have the least medical errors. They just reported the least medical errors. So I think another sign could be if everything is just fine all the time, everything is fine, everyone agrees, um, then it's probably too good to be true. And, and, um, and there's of course also signs, you know, if people, uh, have a lot of sick leave uh, that is not uh, easily explained. Uh, of course, there can be physical things or they can have mental health uh, issues. But if a lot of people are, you know, getting sick um, on Mondays, maybe there's a problem with the, with the psychological safety at work. But the problem with these things is I haven't found a good way to identify when it's not there. Um, it's more indications of this um, and kind of keeping an eye on how engaged are people? Are they saying something? All these things. Dum -de -dum -de -dum. Next question. Since many teams are now, whoa. People, someone voted for a different question now that I was reading this. Since many teams are now spread all over the place, do you have any tips on improving psychological safety for distributed teams? Um, yes. One of the things I think you need to do is very much discuss how you do things. Because some people don't feel comfortable watching themselves on video, for instance. Some people don't feel comfortable all of a sudden having to write everything because written text can be misunderstood. So I think that part of building that psychological safety, you need to actually start having these discussions in the team is how is this going to work for us? Sorry. 
Um, there are also a bunch of articles out there uh, about how it works for distributed teams. But I think very much being aware of this and raising it as a potential problem is, or a potential way of being coming even better, saying, you know what? What we are going to do is um, we have to sit distributed. We want still to be able to have the same good environment that we have. What do we need to do to make sure we have it online as well? But I think very much discussing about the communication and also being open and saying we are in difficult times, so it is okay to not be okay. Saying these things out loud is something that makes a big difference, uh, whether it is online or in a room. Um, like when I do, I've done my short workshop on psychological safety online and offline. Um, and I have these rules that I normally use about safety when I start a workshop like that. Like um, it is always okay to pass. Uh, you don't have to answer. This workshop is not more important than you. You are more important. Uh, and no exercise is more important than you. Everything that we talk about stays in this room. And these things I repeated again when I did this as an online training. And I wasn't sure if it would make a difference, but it actually did. And one of the things that was one of the feedback that I got was that this actually makes a difference for me. It makes a difference that I know I don't have to answer these questions. So going into your team and figuring out, you know, what are the things that we want to talk about and that it's okay and that, yes, we are all going to have bad days. Um, Sometimes it takes a long time before we have a bad day. Uh, sometimes we don't realize what's going on uh, truly until one day where we kind of go, wait, what is just happening? Or we realize we haven't talked, like the other day when I realized I hadn't talked to anyone not on the screen for 20 days. So making this okay to actually talk about and put in time, maybe put in, you know, five, 10 minutes every morning just to have a cup of coffee together. I think that will be a big part of building that safety to also talk about these things. Uh, it's very interesting this about things jumping up and down because people are voting. Uh, I was wondering if there is a counterpart to psychological safety like psychological courage. And if there is, is there a way to strengthen or train that? Aha. Yeah, well, I actually happened to do a talk <laughs> about that earlier. No, that was last year, damn it. Uh, I did a talk last year about psychological safety and courage if they are two sides of the same coin. And I don't think they are, but I do think that they enhance, if you, they enhance each other. Because if you are very brave, I think you are not afraid to also speak up. It's easier for you to speak up if you are already brave. It's easier for you to admit making mistakes or to try out things if you are already brave. Just as if you feel safe in a team or in a working place, it is easier for you to go in and um, and do these things. So you feel safer. No, sorry, um, you feel more brave because you feel safe. So I think they enhance each other. And I think just as with psychological safety, I think courage is very much about something i think it is something you can train and i think step one to train courage is to know that you are already brave all of us are afraid of something and we are already brave for some people actually walking out the door can be brave or speaking in public can be brave so tiny tiny things can be brave and you have already done something that is brave so you need to kind of dig into that and kind of like yes i actually did that and then I think it's like when you learn a lot of things, it's about taking it in small steps. I think what some people try to do both with safety and with courage is they take two big steps. It's a little bit like people when they start running, they go like, yeah, I'm going to do a marathon in three months. Don't start by doing a marathon. Start by buying running shoes. Start by walking around your buildings, then start by running slowly. And the same thing with courage. If one of the things you want to do, for instance, is you want to be a public speaker, Maybe, first of all, try to speak to a teddy bear at home. That's one thing you can do. Or uh, you can maybe say in your team, you know what? I would like to get better at speaking when other people are present. Can I facilitate a daily or a retrospective, for instance? Mm -hmm. So taking these small steps, I think, uh, is part of it. And so I think that courage is a muscle. 
uh, that you can go in and you can train. And there are actually trainings on that as well, both online and offline, um, where you can go in and you can work with your courage. But it's very much about training it, but then also going back into your comfort zone and resting. Just like when, you, when you're training for a marathon, you don't train and train and train and train and train. You take a little bit of a break once in a while and you get the right nutrition, whether that nutrition um, is so when you run, it's about food mostly, uh, or it could be about reading about techniques. When it's about courage, it might be watching a uh, talk or watching, um, reading some books about your area. For instance, like if you want to be a public speaker, there are books about that. If you want to be an author, there are books about that. Uh, so kind of getting that nutrition, but also again, being kind to yourself and know that there will be days where you cannot be brave. There will be days where you won't feel safe to say anything. And that is okay. So also be kind to yourself. So uh, let me see, what is the next question? Do you have any ideas on how to increase psychological safety in a working team, even if you are the only one who cares? Um, my guess would be that you are probably not the only one who cares um, because people do care about these things. But you might be you might feel like the only one because nobody is speaking up about these things. So one thing that you could do if you feel safe enough to do it is ask people you know what, I think this could be something that could help our team. Maybe uh, would anyone like to have a lunch and learn about it? You could watch Amy Edmondson's talk about it, for instance, or you can find some of the talks that are online about psychological safety and why it helps. Um, <clears throat> just to get an introduction to people about what are the things that, uh, that we really need. Uh, so I think uh, that can be one thing. or uh, one of the things you can do, uh, depending on who you are, is you can start asking people, asking people how they are, for instance, asking them about their work. Be curious about it, not judging people, but actually be curious about it. Um, I think if you are a leader, I think uh, Amy Edmondson represents three things. Um, she says, show your fallibility. And I think no matter if you are a official leader like a manager, or if you are an unofficial leader, which all of us are, showing that fall fallibility and showing that you make mistakes. I think that is essential to so being that role model and having that curiosity to kind of say, oh, I don't agree with you. That's really interesting. Could you tell me more about that instead of going into a, a discussion? So learning to have these conflicts uh, as well. Um, but my, my biggest suggestion, my first suggestion would be maybe bring it up at whatever you have, retrospective team meeting and say, I think this is really interesting. I just heard a talk about it. Is there anyone else who would like to talk a little bit about this um, and see if it works? Uh, some people might be working extra. Oh, now it jumped again. Some people might be working extra, but is working extra fair though? Does it help the team? I am in this situation, as I suspect one of my mates is coding a lot and so many tasks are piling up on me and I feel like a bottleneck. I am. And it makes me feel terrible, but I do what I can. I brought it up at our retros that there's a lot on my plate that I feel overwhelmed, but things haven't improved. Any advice on how to approach this? Um, I don't think, um, working extra, um, is always a good idea. First of all, I think that it might feel like you have control over something, but my guess is that the things that you actually do produce are not going to be as good as if you actually take breaks. So that's one thing. Uh, I think bringing it up in a retrospective is the right thing to do. And uh, my assumption, since you talk about coding and that you are the bottleneck, is that you are a tester. Um, so help, saying to people, I need help with testing. And if I keep getting this much 
I will not be able to handle it and we're not going to be able to get things into production. So who is going to help me with testing? Don't ask, is anyone going to help me with testing, but who's going to help me with this? How, what are you doing to ensure the quality on your things before it comes to testing, for instance? Um, it could also be that you are a release manager, but kind of like asking people like, what can you do to help me? And be very insistent on this. And if things are not changing, then um, maybe one of the things that you could do is make sure that there are some actions in the retrospective. Because a lot of things, uh, some of the things that happen often in retrospectives is we talk about things. And then nothing happens in our after our retrospectives because we don't make actions. So you need to have a concrete action with a deadline. Like one of the things could be that uh, somebody um, somebody else helps out with its testing. For instance, somebody else helps out with testing. Um, having an action that uh, the coders cannot produce as much. Um, so I I am not sure I see any other way than bringing this up and having that discussion again. And but also saying what are the consequences? The consequences. Uh, Let's say you, for instance, are a tester. The consequence would be either we get things in production that has not been tested, and it might have a good quality, but we won't know because we haven't tested it. Or we don't get the things into production, which means that the learning that we get later will not be in that code because it's already been produced. So it doesn't make sense to do that. So kind of talk about what are the consequences of having this. Hey. hey. <laughs> yes, my my thing broke. Um, but I'm but I'm but I'm happy that everybody's still on. Um, I was kind of freaking out, but I'm I, I'm. Thank you for freaking out. And I think there's time for one more. Okay. Um, so either you have a favorite one you would like to answer. Um, if you're scrolling through, otherwise, um, I would suggest one. I will take this one. Uh, how do I clearly distinguish between taking care of myself, slowing down versus me making excuses and being lazy? Ha! Ah, my guess is you are not being lazy. Mm -hmm. That is kind of step one. I don't think you are being lazy. I think that you need to take care of yourself. And I think one of the things we a lot of us need to realize during this is that we are under a lot more stress. Our brain is under stress. And when our brain is under stress, it attacks our body. That's the only way the brain knows how, which means that your body is under stress. Um, so you do need to take care of yourself. And that is the first thing you need to do is to acknowledge that you need this. You need to take care of yourself. And yes, there might be things that you will not get done, but that is how it needs to be because you can't take care of everything. And once upon a time, we had airplanes and in airplanes, they would tell us, put the oxygen mask on yourself first. You need to take care of yourself first. And once you've taken care of yourself, then you can go in and you can start thinking about, are you lazy or not? Besides, it's good sometimes to do nothing. If we keep doing something with our brain, what happens is that part of the frontal lobe actually physically shrinks. Uh, I can't say that word. Shrinks, <laughs> so it becomes it literally becomes smaller if our brain is active all the time, and that is the part where our creativity and our innovation sits. So even if it's just that you take care of yourself on weekends, that you take a walk if you can, that you rest, that you see a funny movie, um, whatever it takes for you to take care of yourself. Uh, you are not lazy. I don't believe you are. And taking your care of yourself should be priority number one. Uh, I will, uh, yeah, like Ina said in the beginning, I will see if I can answer the rest of the questions um, and put it on a blog so that uh, we can talk about it uh, or that you can read it later. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, people, the time's up, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, first of all, um, apologies for not uh, being able to assist with the Q&A, uh, but I think you did a wonderful job. <laughs> um, I actually told her yesterday that Chrome would be the best uh, thing to do and to run this on, but obviously it didn't work for me. <laughs> uh, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but you all did really great. And Gitta, thanks again for, for being here and for doing all of this with, uh, with us. And um, I will definitely uh, make sure that all of you will get the link to the video, uh, the link to the blog post, everyone who attended, you will get an email from us and uh, get some of the material that um, Gitta has prepared as well. So I'm very glad everybody's been here. One last big, big screen from, from Gitta. There she is. Thank her again. Um, it has been all her uh, whole session, her talk, her heart. So um, thanks so much, Gitta, and thanks everyone for, for joining us for our yeah. first webinar. Thank you, thank you for listening, and remember to take care of yourself because you're worth it. Thanks so much. Thanks, people. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye.